Sylvia Earl, thank you so much for being here. This is amazing to track you down. <laughs> it's been insane traveling so far this year. Well, but, you know, uh, I, I don't think well, I I don't think people know that um you and I go way back when you were um the Sturgeon General at NOAA. <laughs> Right, and and then you moved on to the National Geographic Society and were the the explorer in residence, which you still are. That's right. And we worked on the Sustainable Seas Expedition. Now back then, you were telling the dive industry, "Listen, we need to get on top of this. Things are happening. We need to be part of the solution." And uh, you were going to many events talking about this. And it seemed to fall on deaf ears, and it must have been incredibly frustrating to you. Well, not entirely uh, deaf ears. There are many people who have been witnesses, as have I, to the changes in the ocean. Since any of us began diving, I started in the 1950s, so my range of observations goes back a little longer than some. But... We've all been a part of this extraordinary time of technological development, of increased knowledge, of awareness about the ocean and what it means to humankind on so many fronts. But I think most importantly, it's just putting together the, the pieces in a, in a way that clarify the state of the ocean and what specifically those who are tied to the ocean, either recreationally or scientifically or through their businesses, and businesses ranging, of course, from the sport diving industry to the commercial diving industry and, and beyond, you know, uh, we're all connected to the ocean one way or the other. It's just a matter of degree and matter of which channel or which of several channels bring you to the table. And here we are. I think it's it's time to really think seriously about the state of the ocean and how those of us who have special insights through direct contact, it's not that we are just breathing the air or enjoying the water that falls out of the sky or a planet that generally works in our favor, but we're out there getting wet, those of us who are witnesses in a, in a special sort of way. Well, the good thing is that this summit is all about action. The people here are listening up. They've been, they've been watching you connect the dots, and now they're connecting the dots. Yeah. And there are more people in the summit who are doing more to connect the dots. And we're, we're learning that we've been, we keep putting this off that it's going to happen in our children's uh, lives or our grandchildren's lifetime. And I was just watching that uh, trailer for um, the plastic, was it the plastic age or the age of plastic um, that Pharrell Williams and Jay Nichols are in. And Jay, I'm going to quote this. He said, the shit is hitting the fan now. So what can we do? What are the biggest issues that we can, can take on as an industry, as individuals, as businesses, what are the biggest issues that are fa we're facing with the oceans right now? Well, we're watching it come apart before our very eyes. We're seeing the systems upon which everything we care about rests, the life support system, the systems that maintain the integrity of a planet that works in our favor. And you can see it clearly in coral reefs, in kelp forests, in coastal areas. The degradation has been relentless. And the trade-offs justified based on our definition of it's good for the economy, or it doesn't matter, or the ocean is so large and resilient that not to worry, it'll recover no matter what we do. But now we know. I think the critical starting point in any action is to realize that for the first time we have evidence that is defensible, that, that you, 
we can see the cause and effect relationships of what we put into the ocean and what we're taking out of the ocean, the connection between what we're putting into the atmosphere and how it's affecting the chemistry of the ocean, how it's affecting the temperature of the ocean, the warming, the, the rapid warming. Of course, the planet's been warming slowly since the height of the last ice age, but nothing to compare with the effects that we've all been witnessing in the last half century or so. Uh, not all people have been witnessing over the last half century, but you can look at the evidence that has been gathered during this time, the correlation between CO2 and methane going into the sky, the warming trends, sea level rise, accelerated sea level rise, accelerated warming, and now to add to that list, the acidification of the ocean driven by carbon dioxide becoming carbonic acid in the ocean. That's not good news, not just for coral reefs, but fundamentally for the life support functions that the ocean delivers that we usually don't account for. We think of it as free. Breathing, it's free. <laughs> but now we know that maybe 70%, certainly more than half, of the oxygen generated, it, it goes into the atmosphere, is generated by creatures in the sea, the oxygen replenished every day. Well, we can still breathe, so most people aren't worried about the effects on phytoplankton, but there's evidence that it is declining rapidly, starting when, again, measurements were really seriously beginning to be made in the 1950s. How much? Well, the measurements aren't consistent, and they're not global in nature, but there's some strong evidence that it's, it's you know, maybe as much as 40%. And because of the, the lag in the system, the resilience in the system, we can still breathe. But I wouldn't want to bet my future on, oh, it'll be okay. Yeah, um, things will move in our favor one way or the other, and so why worry? But once you see what that coupled with the loss of ocean wildlife, the, the big fish, the little fish, we're able before the middle of the 20th century to bring whales from where they had been early in the 20th century. More killing of whales during that piece of the 20th century than, than during all of the preceding years of whaling. But we got really good at killing them and processing them and marketing them. So good that their very future was at risk. And some may never recover from that great era of killing creatures such as the Northern right whale, only 300 plus or minus every year. <laughs> Big concern. Are there more births than deaths? How are they doing? How many moms are there out there? It's just that close that one bad year, one bad storm at the right mo wrong moment or whatever could just wipe them out forever. So, But they're still here. There's still hope. Still at 10% of the sharks. For some sharks, they're not so affected, the deep sea ones, but those that are biting on long lines, those that are captured in, in the nets along with other fish, those that are targeted for sport, those that are targeted just because they're sharks, you know, people still have this mindset that the only good shark is a dead shark. Some others, there's a growing voice for sharks alive. Uh, and there's plenty of reason for hope because we still have even the, the, the most depleted ones, it isn't that the, the, the oceanic white tip sharks are all gone. They're perilously close to being exterminated, but we still have some. So knowing this means you've got a beginning of a blueprint, an action plan. What, here's the problem. If you didn't know there were problems or the nature scope or the, the, the consequences of what these things mean, we wouldn't be motivated or we couldn't be effective in terms of taking action. But now we know. That's the great good news. So this gives you hope that now that we know and we have def definitive data uh, yes. that this is going on, we can move forward. There's no more arguing, I hope. Well, some will find ways to avoid addressing even the most urgent issues, such as the, the state of bluefin tuna. Some say, well, you know how it goes. If, if there are 
you fishing over the ages has been as a matter of policy you you fish one species down till it's no longer commercially viable and then you go on and move to something else and by the time you do a big circle going through one species and then the next and the next the one that you started at the beginning they will have rebounded because you've taken the pressure off but it hasn't been working because we've not taken the pressure off of anything and the phenomenon of the fewer there are the higher the price so bluefin tuna selling for outrageous figures you know even the high point of 1.8 million dollars for one fish I mean it's absurd but there it was and it was a special case but still it was done and it set a mark that these fish are so special that it's so such a um, privilege to have even a tiny slice of, of bluefin tuna that I'll pay anything for it. You know, it's just this notion. It's, it's a choice and it's marketing. It's marketing. Like shark fin soup is marketing. Well, we need to counter that with marketing in the other direction. And it's true across the board. We just have to be outspoken and say, look, coral reefs rock. We have to protect them. Only We only have maybe half of what there were in the middle of the 20th century when I started diving that are still in great shape. Uh, some are still, there's hope for them, but that they, they aren't what they used to be by a lot, either dead or seriously degraded. The good news is we've got something to start with. And meanwhile, the pressures continue, the acidification, the warming trend, the other changes in the chemistry, but if we just take simple things, like in the Caribbean, don't kill the parrotfish, or anywhere, don't kill the parrotfish, don't kill the sharks, don't kill the tuna, don't kill the groupers, do not kill the snappers, stop the killing, just give the systems, give the ocean a break, make peace with the ocean. And we can use the ocean. We can make money from the ocean. We can have livelihoods. We can't do it by stripping it. We can't, we can't clear cut the ocean and still have a business. And we don't Is there such thing as sustainable seafood anymore? I mean, we were stripping it. Is, is any, is there such thing? I don't eat, I don't eat fish anymore. I listened to you and I just stopped a few years ago. Is there such thing as sustainable seafood in your view? Well, it's a matter of scale. If we're trying to support the commercial extraction of ocean wildlife at present levels, I think we should think again. I think that's not realistic. I think it is, we, we've taken too much for too long with, with methods that are so terribly destructive that we have basically broken the system in ways that that cannot be fixed if we continue doing what we're doing. One partial solution to restoring, recovering ocean wildlife, <laughs> that, that's birds, that's whales, fish, shrimp, lobsters, squid, octopus, the whole scallops, you know, you name it. We have really decimated on a scale that is unprecedented in history and certainly unprecedented in the life history the, the life mechanisms of any of these creatures a thousand years ago or maybe even a hundred years ago armed with relatively not primitive but not as powerful uh, the techniques as we now have we were already making serious inroads as I say we already knocked whales down to a considerable extent even before the 20th century when we amp things up enormously with new technologies to find, capture, and market whales. But now we've got those tools plus a whole host of new tools that really shift the balance in favor of catching, killing, marketing ocean wildlife, but not geared toward protecting the source. With Ducks Unlimited, in the 20th century and in the 20s and 30s, it was obvious that if we keep killing, kept killing birds, wild birds, the way we were, 
well, passenger pigeons gone. You know, the Eskimo curlew just essentially wiped out with North America, and others, ducks and geese just going from where they were, plummeting the way we're doing now with fish. Here's where they were. Here's where they are. Well, the idea of protecting areas, breeding areas, feeding areas, corridors over which they pass, not just opposing limits, but seasons. That, and uh, I don't mean just that the, the, the amount, where and how you take wildlife, but first it's, it, you have to know what it takes to make these birds or these fish or these whales or whatever it is. You, you can be really smart if you know what it takes to have healthy populations. But we have so disrupted cod, for example, that knowing what worked in the 1800s as far as generating more cod, or even in the middle of the 20th century, those pathways have been destroyed. Those, those clues to what it takes to make really abundant populations of tuna, to know their migration routes, to know how, at what age they reproduce. Well, we've got information some now, but we haven't really been able to apply it in ways that will ensure a recovery. And we still kill them. That's part of the problem. Cock is still fair game. Um, but you're doing MPAs. This is your thing, the MPAs. So one thing is have areas that you you keep them in the keep things in the bank. Stop the killing. I mean, seriously, stop the killing. And I don't mean just little token areas. I mean large, substantial areas. You know, if I, if I could, I'd say, look, we have to rethink the ocean. And with a, let's start with a concept that the ocean is the most important aspect of Earth as far as what keeps everything that we care about supported our economy, our health, our security, life itself. And with that respect for this is like the blue heart of the planet, what can we, it's not how much should we protect, but what can we take or do to the ocean without disrupting it? We need to have shipping of goods, but from where shipping was 50 years ago to where it is today, it's like the extraction of things. It is just balloon, so it's critically important to our economy that we maintain viable shipping routes. Well, we also, while taking that into account, need to look at how do we have shipping routes that minimize the impact on the migration patterns of whales, of cod, of sharks, of turtles, of you name the things that now that we have some beginning notion about the, the migration uh, routes in the ocean, there's a lot of overlap following currents, following areas of high productivity, whatever they are, armed with knowledge. Let's think about as, as, a, as a, not just as a country or as a company, but as civilization, all of us. What's in the best interest of the human future? And, 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 and to do it in a way that, that is mindful of the need to balance the books. That is, the, obviously, to have shipping routes, to have the aspects of ballast water being shipped all over the place. It's a big thing that is disrupting the ocean. We didn't know that this could be a problem. 50 years ago. Now, now we know. What can we do about it? Noise. Uh, commercial shipping is responsible for huge disrupt disruptions in the soundscape of the ocean. But we didn't know it mattered. We just did not know. I can't blame those of 50 years ago for doing what they did, having big propellers on ships without paying due attention to cavitation that is responsible for much of the large-scale noise. It's also not very efficient to have propellers that, that are noisy. A quiet running system is usually 
much more efficient than one that is just chugging along indifferent to the sound that is being created and to the efficiency. Now efficiency is a matter of concern, but 50 years ago, cheap fuel, it, it, it wasn't one of the top priorities to think about, but now it is. There are a lot of things that overall the ocean industries can be mindful about and take action that are better for their bottom line and better for the ocean. And in the end, part of what has caused the existing degradation of the ocean is lack of accounting for the value of what's there. So you, so you take a thousand tons of some kind of wild thing. Where's the subtraction? on the big ocean balance sheet. It just has an accounting base of zero until it's dead, until it's caught, until it's you know marketed. But in the ocean, we don't think of fish as having any value. At least with oil reserves, you know, you can put a number on what you think is in the ground and that goes on your balance sheet. But fishermen don't own the ocean, although they act as if they do. They do. I mean I want my fish alive. They want the fish dead, but their voice predominates. Mine is regarded as somewhere as irrelevant. <laughs> the law is on their side. The National Marine Fishery Service in this country has a billion dollars of support for fisheries. The National Marine Sanctuary Program has a 50 little m million dollar budget that is aimed at trying to work with fisheries and, you know, be nice to the whole concept of extraction with a very small part of the sanctuaries actually fully protected for the fish, but at least their eye is on protection. That's not the goal of the National Marine Fisheries Service, it's on how much can you meaningfully extract on a sustainable basis, or in some cases, what is this sustainable business? Our business is to get as much as we can, as quickly as we can. Right, right, before the other guy does. Before the others do, and not just limiting this to the United States, it's global. It's global. My question to you is, since you hang out with so many world leaders, what do we need to do to get them to listen up and start to use a different set of metrics? I think we have a constituency of ambassadors out there, the diving community. I think that those who have spent hundreds or thousands of hours underwater, or even sometimes the first look is transformative, uh, scuba divers, snorkelers, those who actually go get wet, commercial divers, they see changes, and although their focus is on getting a certain job done, they're immersed in a living ocean. They can't escape their notice that what, what's going on around them, or those who've been diving for a while see the consequences of what we're putting into the ocean, what we're taking out of the ocean. And they get to see things, sometimes beyond what scientists do. Scuba divers, snorkelers, commercial divers. You know, a lot of scientists do their science from a ship. They put cameras down, some of them out there splashing around, getting wet, but there's another whole army of people out there who get wet because they love it or because, I don't know why because, good exercise or they have a business or a whole host of reasons, you can't just put it down to one reason why does anybody dive. It's fun, you know, it's fun to go out there and get acquainted with the fish and other creatures. For a small portion, it's about let's go kill something, a spear fisherman that there is a, still a wedge of the diving community that is, derives pleasure from going out to kill things. Uh, but the great majority have hung up their spear guns if ever they carry one, picked up cameras, or just go for the pleasure of it, take their kids along, have, have a great time getting to know the ocean. And there's a very strong and growing constituency of the conservation community divers who go because they 
really do want to make a difference, to gather data, to gather information, working with scientists, or sometimes they are conservation scientists themselves, to you know, put it all together. And, that, and now the evidence is very clear. When you go to a coral reef, killing the fish means eventually you kill the coral reef. If you kill the coral reef with dynamite or with siltation or when you just plow your way through it because you're putting a, a, a channel through an area and just get that pesky coral out of the way and destroy it. Well, the fish die, of course, because their home is gone. It works both ways. Kill the fish, the corals die. Kill the coral, the fish die. These are relationships that seem so obvious today, but wasn't so obvious not so long ago. And, and it isn't just coral. It, it isn't just fish. This is like a, a whole, it's like a city. He, the car, you could say that like New York City, it's the buildings, that's the coral. But it's also about the taxi drivers and the garbage collectors and about the doctors and whatever it is, all the pieces of the community that make it function. You take away the garbage collectors, uh, things kind of aren't working the same. You take the cornerstone out of the buildings, then they're not working the same either. They have a way of collapsing. And we're, we're right at that critical point. I think of this as the sweet spot in time when never before could we know, could we know what we now know. And never again will there be a chance as good as what we now have to take action, do something. Everybody can do something. Some people can do a whole lot more than others. But it's amazing how things catch on, that, that you start picking up trash and wow, people see you doing it, hey, that's a good idea. And they're out there helping you out. And that is, there's evidence that this has been happening repeatedly, that somebody gets a bright idea about cleaning things up, or somebody gets an idea about establishing a protected area. That's the, the underlying effectiveness of hope spots. We have individuals, communities, looking out to their ocean backyard and saying, we could, we could make this better than it is. Oh, why don't we celebrate this patch of ocean and declare it a hope spot? Make it, let's get together and make things better. Ultimately, such places might be declared a sanctuary or a marine reserve or whatever, but it starts out with people, individuals, sometimes a kid, Sometimes a guy such as Tony Ribic in South Africa who mobilized six communities over the past year to celebrate the ocean. They had, they had picnics, they had parades, they had you know, celebrations, literally, about their ocean and, and let's, have, let's pull together to clean up what's out there and to protect what's there. And it's, it's a work in progress. There's, there's no official protection of these six hope spots ranging from uh, offshore from Cape Town to Durban, all around the, that whole coastline. But it's an initiative that somebody got started, and anybody can do something, whether it's raising money to support a, an organization that's doing something, or getting some kids to put on masks and fins, go explore the ocean, or working with a school, go give a talk and tell them, the kids, how beautiful the ocean is and ask them what they want for the future. Anyway, there, there are thousands of things people can do. Well, I told you that the, um, I'm going to get my glasses here because I can't see very well. Um, I told you that um, our friends on the Coral List have been very active. Uh, for those who are listening, the Coral List is this uh, listserv of thousands of uh, scientists and people in the dive industry and elsewhere and it's all about coral because coral is central to our our world and um, they this is what they decided they decided that the dive industry needs an action plan and I just want to read you what they what they wrote 
Okay. They said, okay, the leading experts in marine sciences have determined that coral reef ecosystems are now being threatened by a number of issues that pose great threats to their future. Major threats include coral diseases, land-based pollutants, sedimentation, overfishing, rising ocean temperatures, ocean acidification, diver damage, and more. The diving industry, by virtue of its inherent relationship with the underwater world, has a clear and distinct responsibility to help preserve and protect these vital resources. Furthermore, we believe that the future viability of the diving industry depends on maintaining healthy coral reef systems. With that in mind, we call to the industry to come together to address the issues involved. Because of the nature and severity of these threats, we feel that we must act now by facilitating an industry-wide initiative aimed at conserving coral reefs worldwide. There are a number of positive actions that can be taken at every level of stakeholder, including individual divers, dive shops, resorts, certification agencies, and manufacturers. We believe that specific actions would best be determined by a panel of experts comprised of coral reef scientists and dive industry leaders alike. Global threats cannot be reduced by divers alone, but the industry can help by taking a public stand that encourages everyone to consider what is at stake. We are asking divers around the world to join with us by showing their support for this important and timely effort. Working together, we can make a difference and save our coral reefs and ocean for generations of divers to come. So, my question to you is, what do you think should be part of this action plan to get people in our industry on board and addressing those areas where we can have a big impact? And I have a list of what you've already said. I've been writing. I've been taking notes. One of the things you said was, speak up. It's time to speak up. Um, so the next thing you said was, use your constituency. You, we, are a, we have a voice and start to use it. Um, support MPAs. Um, start uh, marketing the environment like you market your business. It is all a marketing message, right? It is. And um, connect the dots. Help others to connect the dots. Uh, education. And you also said celebrate. Create celebrations so that people will be able to connect the dots in a positive way. So there you have it. Anything else you want to add to your action plan? <laughs> well, I think it's important that people know why the ocean matters that it isn't just aesthetically appealing, it isn't just because it might be good for business, it's because our lives depend on it. Really, it's not not at some time far in the future that the unraveling of the ocean systems could happen. It's happening on our watch, and it's on our watch in our time that we have a magnified opportunity almost a responsibility to restore what we can and protect what is still in great shape. And when you see people doing stupid things like catching big grouper, for heaven's sakes, just for the sport of it, I mean, to try to, you know, it's one thing to you know, stand up and shout, but if you can just get them to see what you see, how magnificent these animals are, and, that, and to realize they, they aren't just objects, they aren't just pieces of meat. A lot of the, th the creatures that are taken from the ocean are not even eaten, they're just killed for the fun of it. it. It seems like such a crazy concept. I want to go kill something for the fun of it. Or I want to, I want to go hook something just for the fun of it. And more and more, the, the re reality of it's not much fun for the fish to be caught. If you're going to catch it and eat it, you know, there's a little space for some of, of this tried and true tradition of the hunter-gatherer going out and put in the wild and catching something and then eating it. But with great respect, please, to fill your boat just because you can, uh, give it away just because you can't handle all that you've got. There's, we just have to think differently about the value of, of what's in the ocean. 
and why it matters. To see the connections between the existence of ocean life and a planet that works in our favor. It has to do in part with the nutrient cycle. I mean, sounds like it should be over here in like a biology class or something. No, everybody should get it. Everybody should understand the basics of how it is that we can live on this little blue speck in the universe. That you can go out at night and see all those unfriendly options, but we've got to take care of this one. Because unless we do, we could be <laughs> we could be in real trouble about all the things that that matter. Imagine having to worry a lot more than some of us do about breathing, <laughs> about the carbon cycle. Well, what the heck is that? The carbon cycle. It drives the warming trend, and there are whole policy efforts now on the part of major governments around the world to look at carbon capture and storage, and they look at forests, and they see photosynthesis going on, capturing carbon dioxide, turning it into simple sugar, the food that becomes the basis of much of the food that people and animals consume, the oxygen that's generated in the same process, photosynthesis. And it isn't just the land. Now we're beginning to appreciate, and now there are headlines in certain scientific circles about blue carbon, that the phytoplankton that does much of the heavy lifting in terms of generating oxygen, taking up carbon dioxide, creating the food that generates from not just the little guys that eat the plankton directly, but that is the source for what the little guys are feed along the way. And, and starting with plants at, at the bottom, you ultimately are powering whales that aren't eating the plants directly, or tuna are not vegetarians, but their existence depends on the, the phytoplankton that has to work its way through the food chain to get to where the big fish can actually consume something tangible. They can't eat plankton, so taking little fish like menhaden and herring and the sand lanches and many other things that we take on an industrial scale is like yanking the, the linchpin out of this whole system. If the big fish don't have little fish to eat, they'll die. And the whale's the same. There's more than one way to kill sea lions, we find here in California, because taking all the little fish in large numbers and the squid in large numbers, what are they going to eat? They're starving because we are coming in on a large scale and taking something that if you go back 500 years ago, there were people taking a few of these small fish, but there weren't that many people around at that time. Now, we have not only many more people, but we have techniques that enable us to compete with these animals, the birds, the seals, the fish, the sea lions, the whales. They don't have choices, and we do. We can eat a lot of different things, but we don't have to consume the wildlife. Imagine trying to feed seven billion people with songbirds, eagles, and owls, and little furry things on the land. We were used to when our numbers were small, but we can't do it now if we are to succeed at all. And already most of the calories we do consume come from cultivated animals that are natural plant eaters, although we feed them things that shouldn't be on their menu, like ground up fish. And plants, plants, not just the animals, but most of the calories come from corn, rice, wheat, and soy, and all the other plants occupy a relatively small portion of our calories, and, and animals for calories and even for protein occupy a, a smaller portion of our diet by a lot than what we get from plants. But we've gotten into the habit of going to a restaurant and looking for this zoo of wild creatures from the sea. This wasn't the case a hundred years ago, but it is now. It's a luxury taste that's been acquired and marketed 
why does anybody eat tuna? Because we've been led to believe that it's really tasty and good and good for you. Why do we take fish oil? Because it's been marketed and we're told that it's good for us. If it is, to the extent that it is, we don't have to kill fish to get to the, the omega oils that we derive from, from fish, but we also derive all those things they've been eating that come through that we don't want in us, like the, the mercury and the fire retardants and pesticides, but we can go to the very things that the fish have been eating. They don't manufacture omega oils. They get them through the food chain. And so look for those companies, and there are several that are growing the plankton and making omega oil products that no matter how you look at it, it's a good deal price-wise because although the price is comparable with fish oil, that it has a big expense that we're not paying for, take a bite out of the ocean. And that's not on the balance sheet versus these very efficient methods of growing a plant product that good for the fish, but it's not good for us to kill the fish to get to those same oils. I, I can go on, and like krill and squid are now being captured and get the oil squeezed out of them. It's a pricey product. Why would we go all the way to Antarctica, or in some cases the Arctic, for krill? Critically important for ocean food webs. Critically, they're the cornerstone of these systems. And yet, because they're really abundant, or apparently abundant, it just seems like there's an excess there that we can take with no consequences back to us. But the consequences are a collapse of polar systems to the extent that we undermine the integrity of the food chains. In, in turn, that affects the chemistry of the ocean. It's the carbon cycle. It's the phosphorus cycle. It's the nitrogen cycle, the sulfur cycle, it's, it's the chemistry of the planet. And by breaking those links, by taking out millions of tons of those carbon-based units that we call fish, or squid, or krill, we're breaking those links. And what will be the consequence? We, it's a big experiment in progress. And we haven't been really very good so far at, at looking at the whole planet as an integrated system. We're getting there. It's part of what NOAA does in the positive side of things. It's what NASA does in the positive side of things, looking at Earth in relationship to the rest of the universe. But that's what some ecologists are doing, putting the pieces together. We're beginning to see how, what we can get away with, in a way, and what we must be careful not to disturb. And the evaluation of the ocean to identify critical places that we should just leave intact because they're vital to the functioning of the planet. Not just restoring fish so we can kill more fish, but maintaining a system that makes our lives possible. National Geographic has a, a program called Pristine Seas identifying uh, there are about 20 places that have been earmarked so far that are in you know about as good as it gets in the ocean mostly in tropical areas but in into polar systems as well where if they can be protected they really do provide some cause for optimism hope if you will that we can see them as a source of renewal, but it, that's not good enough by itself. Hope spots are really tar aimed at, yes, embracing all of these beautiful, pristine areas, but places like Chesapeake Bay or the Gulf of Mexico, not exactly pristine, but if we can change our thinking about them, more protection, less or exploitation, or as we exploit, let's be really careful about how. Be mindful of the consequences. Better accounting. We need to think about the real cost of what we're taking out and put in. When you go around and talk to all these world leaders, because that's basically, that is a big part of what you do, how do you think they're making the connection now? Are they, are they starting to see the world as a, an ecosystem and not um, um, a bank? 
well, if they would regard it as a bank, it might be better than what it is right now. It's like a, a cupboard of, res of, of goodies. You just take, 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 not thinking about replenishing it. You wouldn't, I mean, if you want to have a, this, this magic word, sustainable future, you don't just extract from the bank. Pretty soon you run out. That's what's happening. We've been extracting from the ocean bank without really being mindful of, of the damage we're doing. We, we haven't been successful, even those attempts to, to be reasonable about the taking of fish or whales or whatever it is. It's just been take. Let's go get them <laughs> as fast and furiously as possible. More efficient fishing gear. Subsidies for boats. Let's let's just go get them. And a lot of talk about sustainability, but when you look at the numbers, it just doesn't stack up. We we haven't succeeded at all. I mean, there's some good news in U.S. waters about a modest kind of recovery that makes people think, well, we're we're home free. No, it's just a modest bit of recovery with some common sense management practices, but we're not back to where we were in the 50s or a hundred years ago. We aren't back to a, a thriving integrated system that is really doing the heavy lifting in terms of maintaining a planet that works. They're just looking at numbers of fish to kill with their sustainability models for managing fisheries. So it's got to be embedded within the bigger picture if we're going to make any sense of this at all. You were just in China. Uh, how did that go? Well, focus in China was on sharks. The Pew Charitable Trusts asked me to go and participate in a, a, basically a media campaign. Uh, I was on national television in China, have been and will be going forward with various um, interviews and programs that were done during the time I was there not long ago, and to visit schools and talk to the kids about sharks. But here's the thing. If you can, it's like Tennyson's little poem about, about the little flower in the wall. If I could know you all in all, Tennyson said, I, I would know what God and man is. You start with something. You start with a piece and succeed. And with that, you can create a greater awareness about the meaning of it all. So I didn't just stick with sharks with my presentations, but I certainly focused on them as an example of how Earth is like a great computer, if you will. And if you take something out, it doesn't have to be something that looks like very much, a little piece, and everything stops, or everything doesn't function as well as it did when everything was intact, when, when the whole system was totally intact. So you take sharks out of a system and you see the ripple effect through the whole system, including the carbon cycle. They're big predators that give nutrients back into the sea. They're just right for the phytoplankton, eaten by the little guys, eaten by the bigger ones, and ultimately back to sharks. But they're part of this process. Take away the sharks, what happens? The chemistry is affected. How much? We don't really have answers, but we need to have answers to these questions. But we can't just continue doing what we're doing with a, the being, being proactive about anticipating negative consequence, consequences, not just waiting until there are negative consequences before you take action. But uh, certainly we have seen already and documented the problems that occur when you take out the big predators. It's been demonstrated in the Caribbean with data going back 500 years, mining the records, the records, shifting baselines of changes that are triggered by extracting the large fish and the sharks and you know, the predators generally. But you could go to any place in the food chain, food webs, say, well, so what if we take out just one um, a piece of this, what will be the ripple effect throughout the whole system? These are some of the studies that are 
being conducted now to try to really understand how we've gotten ourselves into the fix that we are presently with a degraded ocean and what we can do to start putting things back. And one positive thing is to have large areas that you leave alone to let nature recover and let these places heal. Sometimes you think a species is completely gone and once you stop disrupting the system and hold on to it, hold it steady, sometimes, not always, but occasionally there is a resurgence of creatures that you thought were completely gone. Little things that, oh, there's that starfish again, or there's that little blenny, I thought they were all gone. And, but it, there's no guarantee that things will recover, but it's the best hope we have. I can guarantee that we're not going to have Caribbean monk seals back in the Caribbean or in the Gulf of Mexico because they're gone. Last one seen in 1952. There was hope for a while there might be hanging out in some remote little place, as has happened with things like sea otters and, and the northern elephant seals that are perilously close to being totally eliminated, but then a small population turned up, and with care, with really rigorous protection, a modest comeback has taken place. Not the way they were long ago, but there's hope. There's hope. The, the Gulf of Mexico, um, you've been quite vocal about the BP oil spill. And uh, it brings me back to, we can, we can protect, I mean, it's such a complex question that we have. It's complex issues that we're dealing with. But um, we, can, we can do these MPAs. This is a, an important piece of the puzzle. But then we have the whole issue of throwing way too much carbon up into the atmosphere and it acidifying the oceans. And one of the things that I keep coming across because I'm talking to people all over the world as you are, and I see that, you know, in the EU, they're really starting to, to understand the connections and there are studies and they agree with the studies that this is, this is happening, there's, there's no doubt. And even in Asia, people are starting to agree that this is happening, we are throwing too much carbon in the air. Um, we have we have to you know start switching to renewable energies, and yet here in the U.S. we still have um, enough climate change deniers that we're not moving forward. And it seems in the our dive industry, um, there I don't know how many there are, but I think there's enough that um, it's it's stopping us from moving forward. What do you say to those people in the dive industry that? Um, are still holding on um, to this this uh, this belief that climate change is 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 not real. I get asked sometimes, "Do you believe in climate change? Is this real?" And I said, "Look, it's not a matter of believing one way or the other. Just look at the evidence and enjoy your own conclusions. But you should be obliged to look at the evidence. Evidence is there." NASA doesn't have any particular axe to grind. They have been gathering evidence. No, I mean, it's just here are the facts to the best of our ability. Here's the history. Here's what was. Here's what is. This is what, if you follow the trends, this is where we'll be in another 50, 60, 100 years or more beyond. So you get these predictions about sea level rise, about temperature increases, and the consequences to agriculture, the consequences to things such as, as health, the underlying health, the increased areas where mosquitoes and other insects that we need to worry about, um, what their, their range will, will be creating issues that presently we're, we're not worried about, but should, must anticipate now that we have the capacity to, to think this way. But here's the thing, you know, I, I've been involved with energy industries and with the technologies for ocean access exploration that support the, the whole infrastructure of what we take out of the ocean. But 
they, and, and I realize that we could not know what we now know about the trends. We wouldn't have the evidence. We would not have satellites up in the sky. We would not be able to propel astronauts up in the sky or those of us who like to go diving in the ocean. It's been possible to see incredible advances in human civilization owing to access to fossil fuels. And it's transformed the world. We're living longer, we're living better. Um, generally speaking, again, you can look at that evidence too, that from where we were 100 years ago to where we are today, quality of life, even for those who are in the poorest conditions, is still better. There are reasons for anticipating a better life are clearly there and it clearly anchors back to widespread powerful sources of inexpensive or at least as we accounted for it at the time inexpensive sources of energy we couldn't get here on whale oil or cutting forests you know so we we should be grateful for having burned through those assets in this great big whoosh of, of activity. But the biggest gift that the fossil fuel consumption has given us is now we know what we couldn't know prior to the present time. It's because of that industry. It's because of the price all of us have paid in terms of the effects on the air, the effects on the water, the effects on our health that we have consumed so much so fast without due attention to what the consequences are. But now we are looking at it. It's not just the United States, it's the whole world is saying, look, we must shift gears. Even China that is way high on the list of fossil fuel consumption, coal especially, they are <coughs> leaders in terms of let's look at solar. Let's figure out how we can make that, that leap. And we really need the smartest minds out there. And some of them are in these in, uh, energy industries, but they haven't really been thinking about the reality that let's take the infrastructure that we've got. It's not a matter of let's just keep this going indefinitely because that's just not realistic. And how can we take what we've got and still make a ton of money, but shift gears, turn it into ways that, you know, look at the assets we've got and look at our power and look at the future and see what we as Exxon or we as BP or we as Chevron or we as these smaller companies out there, let's be leaders instead of being regarded as the enemy. Let's be serious about how do we affect real change and get about doing so in a hurry because we don't have a lot of time. There's one industry that I'm particularly fascinated with now that is looking at the energy deep within the earth. That is, you know, you bore into the earth. Some people, well, it's hot because that's where hell is. Well, it's because it's where the hot core of the earth is and you, we can tap into the temperature differential or use that heat, geothermal if you will, and in some cases some really intelligent models for taking some of the existing oil and gas infrastructure with the drilling technology that is needed for both of those industries and shift it to, to tapping in not to fossil fuels but to the heat. You're not taking anything away except the heat. You're not removing, you're not fracturing the earth, you're not pumping huge amounts of water, some water for steam, but it's recycled over and over again. It's not, uh, if depending on which geothermal solution you're looking at, but there are methods that can capitalize on the existing infrastructure. And yes, there's a cost to shifting gears, but think about the cost of not shifting gears. We need human civilization to prosper. And that means looking at what the underpinnings are with a clear-eyed view. It isn't just about the energy benefits. We need to get a whole lot more 
realistic about the energy costs, that is, the cost to a planet that works in our favor, and do it better. It's really been a tremendous lift for all of us for a hundred years, actually less than that. We go back to the middle of the 20th century, that's oil and gas powering our civilization. Go back another hundred years, coal, but we understand there's a huge price to be paid in our health and the health of the planet from burning coal. Why don't we just stop? What do you say to Tony Abbott when his coal ports and putting them on the Great Barrier Reef? I wish I could have a personal conversation with Tony Abbott, but I'm not optimistic that he would entertain a meeting with me, but or that it would be successful because he has a pretty solid mindset that does not allow for discussion. Mindset is, <laughs> it's about here, it's about now, it's about my time in office, it's about his view of the bottom line, not the big bottom line, about the real costs, but it's looking at the profits that can be made from selling Australia's fossil fuels to China. It's about disregard for the value of the World Heritage Area, Great Barrier Reef, uh, either for cutting a channel through it or dumping the spoils upon it. To him, those are expendables that are, that are acceptable. And to stall the, the forward-thinking concept for the entire exclusive economic zone of Australia that under the previous administration had been approved, one-third of it for parks, and the rest to be not just you know, clear-cut, but to be managed within a framework of trying to make better use and careful use of the blue Australia, if you will. It's like having another country to design the future, and armed with knowing that if you could just take a big chunks of it and keep it in the bank, you might be able to, you know, work away at some of the other issues, but to keep the whole system in mind and be prepared to adjust as needed. That was the plan. That was the plan. But it's been really halted, stopped. It hasn't been revoked. It just hasn't been implemented under Tony Abbott's administration. What, about, a, what do you say to um, Stephen Harper and the tar sands? Have you same had a chance? Yeah. I think they're, they're kindred spirits. Brothers separated at birth, I say. <laughs> they, uh, they have a similar mindset, and it's not unique. There are many who think they have the truth on their side. They just aren't looking, not listening to the input from others. They're not looking at the evidence. Because the evidence is, whether it's the tar sands, it's a disastrous, in, uh, economically, it's disastrous. Short-term gain if you don't put the costs on the balance sheet. <laughs> and it's, it's like selling a house when you haven't had to pay for the house. But it's, it's whatever it is, there's a cost to what's there. It's, and we need to shape up. And let the voices of those who are currently the beneficiaries, all of us are, of a planet that works in our favor. Get up to speed, whoever you are, about knowing, looking at the evidence and, and seeing what's happening. And think about the real values of, of what makes life possible. And do something whatever it is. Use your power. Well, we're going to work on this action plan, Sylvia, and we may tap into you for more more guidance if we can track you down ever again. You can. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know how to get to you now. <laughs> well, good luck with this. It's really important.
to engage people. The thing is, you can know and not care, but you can't care if you don't know. And what you're doing is hoping to inspire people to go out and look around, see for themselves what's going on, and then choose something in that great host of possibilities, something that resonates with them, that's something they can do to make a difference. We really need all the help we can get. We we want to um, we want to connect the dots for the people that haven't connected the dots yet, and the more people who connect the dots, we're going to get that positive tipping point where everybody's like, "Oh my gosh, we need to do this now." Uh, and you have been holding that space. You've been connecting the dots for all of us for all these years. You and Jean Michel and the Cousteau family and so many others have been calling and trying to get our attention. And now finally, I think we're reaching a stage where people are waking up and they are getting it. And we're having wonderful uh, documentaries coming out like uh, Revolution, Rob Stewart's Revolution, and Jonah Bryson's Sweet Spot in Time that's going to be coming out. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah and, and he's on the summit. They're actually both on the summit. And uh, some other ones that are coming up, uh, coming out very shortly. And, and so I really feel like the tribe is gathering and I, I, on behalf, I'm just going to say it, I'm on behalf of everybody who's listening, we want to thank you for holding the space at this long until we finally got it. And, and now we're going to go and run with it. We're going to do something with it. And you and, and all those people that have been holding the space for us need to know that you're no longer alone. We, we are getting it now, and we are going to take action. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks for what you're doing. <laughs> Whatever you can do to guide us, we would appreciate it because obviously the uh, the leaders who are in place right now they need some help too. So uh, uh, we need your guidance uh, to move forward. So thank you so much, Sylvia. Thank you from thank the you. bottom of our blue hearts. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> Take care. Thank you.